The Economic Future of the Caribbean, a view from 1943 and its linked to today, with Tony Martin and Erica Williams Connell, up next on Carib Nation. Hello, I'm Doris Dean. Welcome to Carib Nation. In 1943, Dr. Eric Williams of Trinidad and Tobago organized a conference of some of the greatest minds of the Western Hemisphere. The proceedings of that conference are recorded in this book titled The Economic Future of the Caribbean. Joining me first is Dr. Tony Martin to talk about that conference and its role in the political life of Dr. Eric Williams. Professor Tony Martin, thank you so much for joining us in Carib Nation. The book we're talking about is The Economic Future of the Caribbean, initially edited by Dr. Eric Williams of Trinidad and Tobago, and you have chosen to have it republished with a new introduction. Tell us a little bit about why you thought it was important to republish this book, a book that most people don't even know existed or might have been forgotten about. Yes, um, even Eric Williams himself seems to have you know, forgotten it. He only very barely mentions it in his autobiography, Inward Hunger. But I think it's a, it's a very important book for a variety of reasons. First of all, it was based on a conference that Eric Williams convened at Howard University in Washington, D.C. in 1943. The title of the conference was the same as the book, The Economic Future of the Caribbean. And Williams brought together a, a very incredible array of people from a variety of you know, very diverse fields to address this problem. They were members of the um, sort of high-ranking uh, bureaucracy of the Caribbean, the sort of imperial bureaucracy, people from an organization known as the Anglo-American Caribbean Commission, which was a British-American um, sort of a, a body that oversaw the administration of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And they were there. They were radical figures from the Caribbean-American community, people who were advocating for political democracy and so on in the Caribbean. There were academics. There were some of the leading African-American academics, people like E. Franklin Frazier, the famous sociologist, Rayford Logan, famous historian, and many others. There were also uh, mainstream you know, white American scholars from places like Wellesley College and elsewhere. So you had a very wide array of people there, all addressing this very important um, issue. So if for no other reason, just um, as a snapshot of a very broad cross-section of people, important people, addressing this issue in 1943, that alone, I think, makes the book important. Mm -hmm. When you look at the importance of many of the points raised at that uh, conference and the relevance today, uh, it almost boggles the mind mm -hmm. when you think of the foresight and the vision of these people. Talk a little bit about the vision of Dr. Williams, mm -hmm. uh, a young scholar at that time, mm -hmm. and the influence he's had both on the Caribbean and on American leadership. Yes, yeah, so, um, Williams is really an, an extraordinary person in our history as you know, Caribbean people, as Caribbean American people. Williams had gotten his doctorate in philosophy at Oxford University in 1938. And a few months later, he came to Howard University as an assistant professor. This is in 1939. And he very quickly established himself as a major intellectual force. You know, he won prizes, he got fellowships, you know, he, he almost instantaneously became a major figure in the very thriving, you know, um, academic life of that period. He also, from the very beginning, too, had a very great interest in politics. Even as a student in England, he had moved in some very, very, very radical political circles mm -hmm. with people like the great uh, Pan-Africanist C.L.R. James, people like George Padmore, another very mm -hmm. great Pan-African figure. So he brought that sort of political... Um, background with him to the United States of America. So what you found here at Howard then was his political sort of orientation, you know, being wedded to his incredible, you know, scholarly ability. And, and th this became a very, very important mix. So the conference, I argue, is a sort of a, a manifestation of those two 
interests, and they converged in Williams, and eventually, many years later, I think, led to his political career mm -hmm. in Trinidad and Tobago. The impact of that conference on the Caribbean then and even now mm -hmm. uh, is al also quite clear. Mm -hmm. In this area, when we're talking about the single market and economy across mm -hmm. the Caribbean, mm -hmm. link those two. Okay, yes. No, Eric, Eric Williams was a great advocate of federation for the Caribbean. And most of the speakers at that conference also, very interestingly, advocated some kind of federation. There was a, a realization that the units, the individual units in the Caribbean were relatively small and that they needed some way to combine, you know, their individual strengths into, you know, a, a sort of a critical mass that could impact on the world. And so you found Williams advocating some kind of federation. There were some people from Puerto Rico and Cuba advocating a Hispanic federation. Mm -hmm. Some were advocating a political federation right away. Some were advocating an economic union that would then move eventually towards political union. But you had all kinds of ideas being put forward. But the underlying unity of these ideas was for some kind of unity, um, some kind of federation. And also, as a corollary of federation, there was a lot of talk, too, about Im improving the sort of inter-island mm. communications as well. Mm -hmm. Which is something that is still lacking today. Uh, absolutely, it's yes. Incredible. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that the leadership today in the Caribbean has digested some of what's in here? I believe that there are moves of foot in the Caribbean today, yes, towards closer union. There are, there are a variety of regional bodies. Of course, there's the FTAA, the mm -hmm. Free Trade Area in the Americas. Um, there's CARICOM, you know, which, is, which has been around for a very long time, mm -hmm. the Caribbean Economic Community. And I know that they have been trying to expand. They've been trying to move out of the formerly British islands to incorporate places like, say, Haiti and Cuba and so on. And who knows, out of that kind of infrastructure, as, as in the case of Europe, out of that initial economic in infrastructure, hopefully, eventually, mm -hmm. might come some kind of a political union later on. Mm -hmm. One of the things mentioned in the book, and most people will connect the two, is mm -hmm. um, the relationship with CLR James. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I can get through this interview without referring to that simply because we've, we've heard over the years of, of that. Talk a little bit about that and the reference to that in the book um, and how Dr. Williams himself dealt with that. C.L.I. James, of course, is, is a great figure in the history of Pan-Africanism. And here we are having this interview in, in the Washington, D.C. area. And of course, C.L.I. James actually taught for a while mm -hmm. at what was then Federal City College, now the University of the District of Columbia, also at Howard University. I remember as a student, actually, in 1970, <laughs> coming from Michigan State, where I was, to Howard University, to a conference where C.L.I. James was the great star figure and whatnot. But James is a major figure in our history. He, he was a Marxist intellectual, a Trotskyist. He was an activist in all kinds of ways. When Eric Williams was in London in, in the 30s, uh, James was heading something known as the International African Friends of Ethiopia, mm -hmm. which was formed after the um, Italian fascist invasion of Ethiopia. He was also very active in George Padmore's Pan-African mm -hmm. Federation and a whole bunch of organizations like that. And Williams would have been around the periphery of those organizations. There's no evidence that Williams actually joined any of those organizations, but he certainly was part of that milieu mm. out of which those organizations arose. Um, Williams also collaborated with um, James on James's um, academic work. James also, like Williams, straddled the academic and academic. the political arenas. James's great work is The Black Jacobins, mm -hmm. a history of the Haitian Revolution. And when James was doing his research in the 30s in Paris, into the archives and so on, that's the, you know, pertaining to Haiti. Williams apparently um, accompanied him to um, Paris, and the two men collaborated. They helped each other in their respective, you know, academic pursuits. So that, that's, that's, that, that's the basis. Of course, James was a very radical figure, and by the time this 1943 conference comes about, you know, Williams is trying to put together what I call a coalition, if you like, mm -hmm. of the radical elements and also of the imperial overlords as well. And uh, it becomes a very, 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 um, very delicate, tricky, line. very delicate thing. Yeah. And, but I think he succeeded. Yeah. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. For young people today who I think curious about the Caribbean, a second generation uh, Caribbean people living in America mm -hmm. 
who did not grow up with, and to the, I think the fault of the many, many of us in our generation, who have not kept alive that Caribbean heritage for their benefit. What would you say they can take from this and move ahead in, in terms of recognizing, appreciating their heritage, mm -hmm. but helping also in the development of the Caribbean? Well, one thing they can take away from this is the, um, the, sort of, the, 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 the sort of very close connection that there has always been between the Caribbean and America, and the Caribbean mm -hmm. and African America especially. You had some of the greatest you know, figures in African American intellectual life participating in this conference, even though the conference was ostensibly primarily about the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. In fact, Eric Williams is actually the co-editor of this book. Yeah, right. You know, even though I think he was by far the most prominent mm -hmm. figure putting together the whole conference, but nevertheless, um, he was actually officially listed as the co-editor together with E. Franklin Frazier, mm -hmm. one of the greatest of all African-American sociologists. And there were many other people of, of similar stature at that conference. There was Rayford Logan, one of the legendary figures in African-American um, history, people like that. And Williams also interacted with many other people like that. Uh, he, for example, in 1940, shortly after coming to the US, Williams won the prize for the best essay you know, published in the Journal of Negro History, edited by the legendary father of African-American history, Carter G. Woodson, mm. the man who gave us Black History Month and all kinds right. of other things like that. So I think that you know, the, the Caribbean uh, American generation of, of today can learn from the fact that there was a very high level of cooperation, mm -hmm. and that you know, and then both groups, I believe, in that period realized that the future of the two areas was intertwined. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you look at the WTO, mm -hmm. uh, the relationship between U.S. and Europe and the Caribbean, mm -hmm. with in that connection, do you see the Caribbean taking its place in the world in world economics, so to speak? soon or are we dragging our feet? I'm not sure if you're dragging our feet or feet. I mean, there's so many you know, major forces against us and, and that's again you know, Williams's argument for federation that, that if we were combined right. it might give us you know, more bargaining power. You know, we, we one thing of say the banana industry you know, in, in mm -hmm. those small islands you know, at the mercy of American foreign policy and so on. You know, I, I don't think that those kinds of, of problems are due necessarily to us dragging our feet. I think that they're, they're an indication of our smallness, mm -hmm. our rel relative weakness. And the need for interdependence. Absolutely, yeah. yes. But, I, I, but I, I, I'm, you know, I have great hope for us. Um, you know, I, I'm a great sort of, you know, almost chauvinist, you might say, Caribbean chauvinist. I, I think we have a wealth of talent in, in the Caribbean. Much of it has, of course, impacted positively in North America. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, and we, have, we have potential. You know? We have a highly educated community, and we true, have potential. True, true. Some people feel that we are facing another form of imperialism today when we look at what is happening around the world and, and uh, the role that uh, the United States is playing. This book almost tells us what is likely to happen. Um, in, when you look at, at the trend that things have taken. Do you see the Caribbean, uh, one of the things we've always been calling for is for the Caribbean to chart its own course mm -hmm. uh, and stand up and, and, and create its own format, its own road map. Mm -hmm. How beneficial can this be to the leaders of today who are struggling with the FTAA, WTO, oh. and, and all of that? I think it, it can be an inspiration, you know. And again, you know, there were many voices at that conference in 1943, you know, some very radical voices calling for, you know, an independent Caribbean voice. Mm -hmm. There was a, a lawyer there called Gilberto Concepcion from Puerto Rico, you know, who very uh, stridently almost advocated, you know, independence for Puerto Rico. You know, again, there were the people from the Caribbean American community who were calling for democratization in the um, Caribbean. And one of the things, interestingly enough, that they were calling for also was for Caribbean representation, of which there was none yet, on the Anglo-American Caribbean Commission. Mm -hmm. Eric Williams was eventually the beneficiary of that agitation for a Caribbean presence at the very highest echelons of that Caribbean Commission. So I, I think that, you know, yes, you know, I, I think that the sort of seeds of that nationalist fervor can be found in this conference, and, and I think that you know, the current generation can benefit from that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
talk a little bit about when you chose to rewrite the introduction, mm -hmm. some of your own thoughts about the path the Caribbean has taken. Okay, uh, when I did the introduction, I, um, I focused to a large degree on Williams himself. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, relative, you know, a good deal is known about Williams in his more overtly political period from 1956, when he became, you know, the major figure in Trinidad politics up until his death in 1981. But there wasn't that much known, I, I didn't think, about this earlier period. Mm -hmm. And so my, my idea was to try to focus on that earlier period and, and, and to sort of, you know, kind of flush out Williams, the man, you know, and whatnot. And what I discovered was that he already in this early period had his, his mind set on politics. politics he yeah. already saw his, his academic work as nothing but a facilitator, if you like, for his larger political purpose. He was already um, lobbying to get into the Anglo-American Caribbean Commission. And um, he saw that as a, as a beautiful perch from which he could, again, you know, really get in, become involved mm -hmm. in, in the politics and the economics and the whole so social structure and the administration of all of those areas in the Caribbean. And so he, he was successful in all this, you know. Uh, so um, it seems to me that, you know, it, it really shows his single-mindedness, you know, mm -hmm. A, his ability, B, his self-conscious realization of that ability, but C, very importantly, you know, his, um, his realization that he owed something, you know, he owed something to his community, you know. He, he knew he was an able person. There's no way he could not have known it. He came first in the, in, in the whole university at Oxford right. University, graduated at the top of his class. So he was, and he had had a whole history of academic excellence even before, before that. that. So right. he, he, there's no way, you know, he, even with all your modesty on his part, there's no way he could not have known he was a brilliant intellect. But it's very fascinating to see him very self-consciously, you know, make the decision that he, he would use this mm -hmm. ability which he had to further the aspirations mm -hmm. of the Caribbean people. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. It's Thanks. been a pleasure talking with you. The late title of the book is The Economic Future of the Caribbean. Coming up in the next segment, we'll talk with Erica Williams Connell about the Eric Williams Memorial Foundation after this short break on Carib Nation. You're watching Carib Nation Television. Welcome back to Carib Nation. We've been talking about the book The Economic Future of the Caribbean. To talk with me about the Eric Williams Memorial Collection in this segment of the program, we're joined by Erica Williams Connell. Thank you so much for joining us on Carib Nation. It's a pleasure to talk with you and to meet you finally. Thank you, Denise. Um, you have collaborated with Dr. Tony Martin on this book, The Economic Future of the Caribbean. Uh, but before we talk about the book, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Eric Williams Memorial Collection, which you founded. Talk about why you founded it and what you hope to achieve with it. Um, uh, I guess you could call me the founder, but um, my father, when I was 14 years old, I remember talking to my dad. Um, he used to talk periodically about what he wanted you know, at his death. And I remember saying to him many, many times over the years, but beginning at, at around 14, that I didn't want anything from him except his books and papers. I had absolutely no clue what I would what do with them. I was only interested in boys. Three things, <laughs> boys, boys, and more boys. So I had no clue what I was going to do with them, what it meant to have them, why I wanted them. I had absolutely no clue. I only know that I still, at 54 years old, have uh, books from my childhood g given to me when I was four, five, six, etc. So there was obviously something in my makeup that uh, sort of intrinsic appreciation of history mm -hmm. which makes it even more uh, amazing, you know, because I failed at history so miserably at school. It's but I obviously amazing. had that um, sort of intrinsic historian's desire mm. to keep things, I guess. Yes. And so, anyway, that, that's what I always said to him. And of course, at his death, that's exactly what he did do. Is he left me his books and papers, which consisted of um, innumerable um, scholarly papers, a miscellany of reports, um, you know, doc conference documents, all sorts of things, drafts of books, etc., uh, from his, uh, not only his scholarly life, but also his quarter century administration as head of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Also his personal and rather eclectic library of 7,000 plus volumes. Mm. So that's what 
went to form the core of the Eric Williams Memorial Collection, which I deposited at the University of the West Indies. Um, I believe it was from 1989, mm -hmm. and it took them several years to do what they needed to do uh, with it, catalog index, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, in 1998, we were formally inaugurated by the former U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell. Mm -hmm. And in 1999, we were named to UNESCO's prestigious Memory of the World Register, which is the United Nations' attempt to preserve the world's historical mm -hmm. and cultural heritage. Right. Uh, obviously, um, recognizing the contribution that your father had made, uh, which is something that I think most Caribbean people understand, but maybe some have taken for granted uh, in terms of the wealth of, of information that has been left for our young people especially. When Dr. Martin came to you about writing this, why was it important for you to collaborate on this particular book? Well, as I mentioned, the, the Eric Williams... of this book. Right. As I mentioned, the Eric Williams Memorial Collection is on deposit with the University of the West Indies, and it consists of a... We also have a museum as well as the library and archives and the usual reading room for scholars, etc. But we, we do have a museum, and um, although that is the physical repository of the collection in Trinidad and Tobago, the collection is far, far more than mm. that. We sponsor conferences. There have been four international conferences on Eric Williams, uh, from uh, one in Italy in 1984 to the last one at the Schomburg Center mm -hmm. uh, in New York in 2002. Um, we uh, sponsor con uh, conferences. We have a lecture series at Florida International University, which is Miami's largest public mm -hmm. university. We're in our seventh year, consecutive year. We sponsor panels. There are four panels on Eric Williams alone this year. Um, we um, I sponsor scholarships as well. There's an Eric Williams sp scholarship annually um, given by the University of the West Indies. We um, promote uh, books. Um, mm -hmm. Eric Williams' Capitalism and Slavery is being translated into Korean this year for the very first time. Mm -hmm. um, this year also saw the republication in ja of the same book in Japanese for the first time in 30-something years. Um, Columbus de Castro has, is being translated for the first time this year into Spanish. Mm -hmm. So we, we do, you have the physical repository in Trinidad and Tobago and you have the projects. The ongoing and projects. So when Tony came uh, with this idea, this was a, an absolute natural. Yeah, yes. And we're also now talking with a publisher about republishing Eric Williams's autobiography, which has been out of print for years, mm -hmm. Inward Hunger, as well as two other books as, well, you know, as yeah. well. So this is just part, part of part what of the we process. do. Yes. <laughs> uh, what is your general opinion of the state of the Caribbean's economic situation today? And where do you see its future as now that King Sugar is no longer king? I just read that St. Kitts has decided to abandon sugar as well in favor of tourism. Uh, with tourism as the main income earner for most of the Caribbean today, talk about your impression or your, your thinking of the economic future of the Caribbean based on what we have here. Well, I think, I think what was uh, very striking about this particular conference from which the book emanates is the requirement, the imperative, which is more pronounced today for the Caribbean to get together mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to get its act together and to stop talking. You know, I mean, we're talking yeah. ourselves out of our existence. Yeah. And frankly, um, we are... Um, uh, we have become, and let me be very graphic about it, a corn on the little toe <laughs> of uh, the yeah. United States of America instead of a bunion on the big toe. Mm -hmm. And until we uh, get our act together and talk about not just independence, but interdependence, Inter right. which is what Eric Williams right. has advocated for mm -hmm. so many years and others as well. Um, we're, we're sort of, you know, like that proverbial Trinidad and Tobago saying, we're spinning top in mud. <laughs> um, there is an absolute imperative. We must get together mm -hmm. and we must act. We can see. It's not like we don't have a big, a huge precedent in front of our noses this every day. It. The mm -hmm. European community. Yeah. We must speak. In order to have any kind of bargaining power mm -hmm. uh, in the world, 
In 2003, the chief U.S. diplomat for Western Hemispheric Affairs gave a presentation to a uh, large uh, group of people about the FTAA. Mm -hmm. and, uh, not the FTAA, well, the, the Caribbean WTA. Latin American Free yeah. same thing, I guess. And um, he failed to even mention the Caribbean. Failed mm -hmm. in what, a 45-minute presentation? Yeah, One immensely aggrieved Caribbean envoy who was in the audience actually got up and publicly chastised the speaker and said he hoped that this egregious omission was not stated U.S. governmental policy, mm. but the point speaks for itself. Of course. It wasn't so, even... um, yes, there is an imperative. Mm -hmm. um, certainly CARICOM is, is moving forward. And I think that these, the kind of um, uh, vision that Eric Williams and others like him had for the integration of the Caribbean is not something that can be accomplished in a generation. Right. I think this this will take and has taken several generations, so, yeah. but the time now is to act. And, mm -hmm. you know, we Caribbean people love to talk, me mm -hmm. included, but you, you must follow this up with, you must back this up right. with action. Someone once said to me that the Caribbean uh, seems to have the greatest ability to produce orators. Yes. Uh, but we don't get a lot done. We don't get and, a lot and done. And that is unfortunate. And very often I think what happens is what we do get done moves us one step forward, and then what we follow that up with moves somebody us 14 back. Somebody reinvents the wheel again exactly. and we go back Exactly, steps. And uh, we need to, you know, Eric Williams said in, on August 31st, 1962, that history is, a, a, an, a, well, I'm paraphrasing, is a, a, a recognition of the past as a guide to future mm -hmm. action. Mm -hmm. uh, the Caribbean nation cannot possibly know where it is going to if it does not know where it has come right. from. Right. Let's talk a little bit about Dr. Williams, the person, as a father, uh, as an only child, obviously you must have learned a great deal at his feet. What were some of the greatest lessons you learned from him that have carried you through life or helped frame your philosophy? Um, he was the most immensely wise person I have ever met. Um, he had an impeccable sense of timing, not impulsive mm -hmm. or impetuous like I tend to be sometimes. Um, extraordinarily humble person, yet at the same time he could be totally so arrogant yeah. with his political opponents and other people that he variously put in cold storage you know, throughout his life and their lives. Um, but, but essentially in his person, a very, an extraordinarily humble person. Mm -hmm. He did not set store by the outward trappings of mm -hmm. power. As far as the benefit of this book for young people today, those who are curious about the Caribbean want to understand.